Hi, Kevin from the Matsaurus here, and in this video I'm going to go through the solutions to questions 4, 9, 14, 19 and 24 of the Junior Maths Challenge from 2020. Just before we get started, let me tell you about a course that I've made to help you prepare for the Junior Maths Challenge, links in the description below. This is a totally free course, and in it I'm going to walk you through 20 problems that I've designed specifically for this course. They're challenging problems that will help you prepare for maths challenges and really just help you enjoy maths beyond the sorts of things you're doing at school. For each question, you'll first see the question on the screen, so you can have a go at it and try to work out the answer. Then, if you're stuck or you want to think of different ways of solving the problem, you can watch my video Hint, and then you can have another go at solving the problem. Once you think you've got the answer, you can choose the answer from a selection of multiple choice options on the screen. It'll tell you whether you're right or wrong. Then you can either have another go at the question if you got it wrong, or watch my video Solution uh, if you are really stuck, or if you want to see if there's another way of solving the problem apart from the way that you did it. And it really is a totally free course, so I really hope you'll sign up below and work through these problems with me. Let me show you the solutions to questions 4, 9, 14, 19 and 24 of the Junior Maths Challenge from 2020. How many centimetres are there in 66.6 .6 metres? Well, one metre is 100 centimetres. So to go from 66.6 .6 metres to centimetres, I'm going to have to do 66.6 .6 multiplied by 100. Uh, so times 10 would make 666, times another 10, 6,660. And so the answer is B, 6660. One half of one third of one quarter of one fifth of a number is two. What is the number? Well, it's awkwardly phrased, but it's not a terribly difficult question. You know, if we've just got to work back from two here. So if one fifth of a number is two, then that number must be two times five uh, or ten, right? And then if one quarter of uh, one fifth of a number is two, well, that's saying one quarter of, uh, of, the, of the number is ten then. So I need to multiply by four as well. So I do two times five times four. And then it's a third of that. So it's times three and a half of that is times two. So um, if I take, you know, one half of this number, it would like undo the multiplying by two, a third of it undoing the multiplying by three, a quarter would be undoing this multiplication, a fifth would be un un undoing this, and then I'd get two. So this is the number that we want, and then we've just got to work it out. You can see then it's one of the bigger numbers, not the fractions. So I've got 10 times four is 40, times three is 120, times another two gives us 240, and the answer is A, 240. It says in the diagram angle OLM is twice as large as PON. So in this sort of question, the first thing I would do, I would just label those, right? So twice as large as PON, so PON will make that one X, and um, OLM, this one here, well, that's twice as large, so let's call that 2X. Um, and then just start filling in anything you know. Okay, we want to work out what this OLM is. So this angle in here is 180 minus 124, that's 56. And uh, okay, these are opposite angles, so that one would also be x, and now I can see that I can sort of work it out uh, based on this triangle here. Let me just see if I can write that a bit more clearly. Maybe if I don't draw the angle, I can write x. So this angle here is 180 minus 2x, but it's also 180 minus 56 minus x because of the angles in the triangle, right? The angles in the triangle say that 56 plus x plus this unknown one here, um, why don't I just give it a name? Let's call it y is 180, but it's also that 180 minus uh, 2x is equal to y, right? So um, so it must actually be that um, this uh, 2x is the same as 56 plus uh, x, right? Because what I'm saying here is that y is um, 180 minus 2x, but y is also 180 minus this 56 plus x. Okay, so either way, uh, you know, it's 180 minus 2x, or it's 180 minus 56 plus x, I get the same thing. And there's also a result about triangles that you might know that, you know, this is always the case, right? If you've got a triangle, this sort of exterior angle here is always the sum of the other two angles. Um, that's a, something I go through in the full go for gold in the JMC course, actually. And uh, so you could just go straight to 22x equals 56 plus x if you knew that fact. Anyway, um, so we get uh, subtract x from each side, and so we get that x is 56, and it asks for OLM, which is 2x. So 2x here is 112. And the answer is D. 
it's in the table shown the sum of each row is equal to the right of the row and the each sum of each column is shown below the column so that means like j plus k plus j is 5 k plus k plus j is 7 and uh, there's different ways you can uh, work out the answer here for sure one thing I notice um, is that if I look at this uh, row that would mean that 2k plus L is 13 and if I look at this column 2k plus j right is only 7 so actually that means that L must be 6 bigger than j now assuming these are all like positive integers um, then I could probably just state say straight away well if, if L has got to be 6 bigger than another integer well j is 1 then L 7 right I mean so uh, so actually I might just I might just go with that and say I think j equals 1 uh, L equals 7 and then uh, I can work out well that would mean that k would have to be 3 and you can just sort of verify that it does work in this table so a good maths challenging way of doing it there is at that point just to say yeah we know e is 7 uh, if you don't want to uh, do it uh, quite so sneakily as that of course we could put those together and say well I know this means that uh, L is j plus 6 and then I could just find a column that just has j and l in it so like this one here and I can say j plus 2l equals 15 but if l is j plus 6 then j is l minus 6 and if I substitute that in here I get l minus 6 plus 2l equals 15 so 3l is 21 and so again then l is 7 as we found before um, so you can deduce it absolutely for sure there uh, but it's the math challenge you know part of the game we're playing here is to try and get through the questions quickly and use whatever tricks we can to give ourselves time to think about the later questions. Okay, so it says Susan's attending a talk at her son's school where eight rows of ten chairs where 54 parents are sitting. She notices every parent is either sitting on their own or next to just one other person. What's the largest possible number of adjacent empty chairs in a single row at that talk? So this is one of those uh, sort of problems where we're always just trying to like stretch the situation to give like the worst or the best case scenario depending how you're thinking about it, right? So, um, so this imagine this is just one of the rows of ten chairs and I want to try and put like as many uh, parents in this row as possible. Uh, so that I can say, oh, let's fill up, let's fill up the first seven rows as much as possible, and then we'll think about the last row and see like what the most space I can leave in it is. So um, if I've got uh, two sitting next to each other or one sitting next to each other, that's the only possibility. I'm going to want to put as many twos next to each other as possible, so I don't leave too much space, right? So I could put two parents here, I could leave a gap, I could put two here, I could leave a gap, put two here, I could leave a gap, and put one here, right? And really, that's the you know that's the smallest gaps I can leave here obviously I never want to leave a gap on the very end because that's just a wasted gap um, and if I start with two on the end um, or one on the end I'm going to end up with the same con configuration here so I could put these three gaps you know um, uh, anyway here as long as I have three pairs in a single but um, there's going to be three gaps so in a particular row I can get seven uh, seven parents in a row right so I've got seven parents and if I put seven parents in each of seven rows then that's 7 times 7, which is 49 parents in those rows. So that leaves 5 parents for the last row, and this is the one where I'm going to try and design the biggest gap possible. So again, I could try and put 2 next to each other here on the side, I have to leave a gap, put 2 next to each other, leave a gap, and then I've got to put 1 somewhere. Now oh, that leaves a gap of 3 here, and I just sort of think, is that the best I could do? Is there any way of, of playing around with this? Well, actually, of course, if I... At the moment, I've got this gap here. If I put that last parent on the end instead of here, then I get a gap of four. And if you play around with this, there's now really no better way we can uh, we can do this. Um, that's really optimised the situation. I mean, try playing around with it if you're not sure. But that's the best. And so the maximum possible of adjacent empty chairs there can be is four, and the answer is B. Hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget that the best way to prepare would be to click the link below and to sign up for my totally free online course.